Okay. Ready, ready, Kevin? All right. Morning. Uh, my name is Gary Matsuoka, and this is Laguna Hills Nursery. And today's topic is growing apples and pears. Um, two generations, well, back in the 1970s, we didn't offer apples and pear trees at our store. No one really thought of growing them. Maybe back in the 60s, around 1970, we brought out a few apples. Uh, we tried a few pears without much success. But by the late 80s, uh, we're finding out that just about any apple we tried grew. And now, uh, and over the years, our supplier, our biggest supplier of, of uh, apple trees in the United States, Dave Wilson Nursery, was so confused about what was going on in Southern California that they tr put a trial garden at the field, South Coast Field Station in Irvine. Pretty much everything in their catalog, which may be 70, 80 varieties of apples, they planted there. And that was about five, six years ago. And they're ama they said they're amazed. All but two cultivars made commercial quality fruit. So you can grow just about any apple you want. Um, now apples originated, we'll start with apple. apples originated in, well, they, they actually native to the northern hemisphere, the, the uh, genus of apples, malus, crab apples are found throughout the world. The biggest apples that we get our commercial apples from were from perhaps uh, Western Asia or you know, Western, they say Kazakhstan, which is now you know, Southern Russia. Uh, that area is where the original commercial apples, the big apples, uh, originated. And they were taken around the world um, from that point. So now apples used to be much more important to the American diet than they are today. Back in the 1800s, they said there wasn't any good water to drink. You know, you couldn't, river water was not safe. Well water wasn't really safe. Apple juice was safe. So making your own cider was extremely important to the people moving from the East Coast West. And Johnny Appleseed certainly at that time threw apple seeds all across the United States to help the new settlers get their apples and their cider. So it was extremely important. I think they said people had to eat a couple hundred, consume essentially a couple hundred pounds of apples per person per year uh, to have enough liquids to drink. Besides milk, cider, there wasn't really much else that was really safe to drink at that time. Now since water quality improved in the 20th century, then uh, apples became less important. But there's still quite a big crop across the world now. At this point, China, they said, grows over half the crop of the world. Of course, I would say half the people in the world live in China, <laughs> so that makes sense. 5% um, of the apples are grown in the United States, most of them on the west coast of the United States, because we have a little better climate for them. So what do apples need? Um, Fortunately, and we can talk about apples and pears because they're both about the same, they don't need good quality soil. So they can live in sandy soil, they can live in clay soil. Uh, the roots on both apples and pears uh, don't have to have very permeable soil. The soil doesn't have to breathe too well. Roots on plants need to breathe oxygen. Apples and pears can get by with very low oxygen levels. So most people have no problem growing apples and pears in any soil in this area. But on the other hand, they need lots of water. They really like the soil never to look dry. Now pears are a little better uh, than apples that way. They, they can take it drier, but they both need ample water to do a good crop. I mean, if ap the soil run apples looks dry, they're not happy. It's got to look damp. Yes. Is that year-round or is it just... When they're growing. So when they're when they're yeah when not when they're sleeping, but uh, of course here when they're sleeping it's usually wet anyway. But uh, during the summertime they do need ample ample water. So they do great in lawns where you have lawn you know the lawn watering would be equivalent to what apples and pears would like. 
So you can certainly plant them in your lawn or take your lawn out, put apples and pears in instead. They're a better crop to eat. So when you plant them, um, all that you do, now this time of year we have the bare roots. Um, and all you basically have to do is make a hole in the ground and make sure that the root system gets into the dirt. On this particular tree, all the apples and pears we sell are grafted. <laughs> I can be able to untie that. So on a apple trunk, you kind of see this little dog leg. So I don't know if you can see that through the bag there, but the root stock is this part here. This they they put a about an eight inch piece of stem in the ground and grow the roots from that piece. Um, they cut off the top and graft the apple to the side of this trunk. So this is root stock down here. Everything above that knob there is the tree that we want. Now we, most of our apple, all of our apple trees are on a semi-dwarf rootstock. So if you have a full-size apple tree on a full-size rootstock, that is, and the way they grow full-size rootstocks, they just start a seed in the ground and grow it, and you get a tree that can grow 30, 35 feet or more. We don't want that. Plus those take about five years to uh, um, mature and make fruit. So they're just real slow to develop and real vigorous at the same time. Now it is true that the seedling rootstock, the standard rootstock, is the most drought tolerant rootstock, but we do a compromise. So they make rootstocks that keep apple trees no more than eight foot, 10 foot tall. But we've been, we've been told to stay away from that. They use that in Oregon, Washington, where they get you know 50 inches of rain or whatever rain they get up there. They said, there's no way that this tree can be grown in Southern California, plus, the ones that are super dwarfing, the trees need support all their lives. They can't stand on their own. So we, we use what is called, this is M111 rootstock. Sometimes we use M7, and those are semi-dwarf rootstocks. The trees will grow maybe 15 foot if you don't trim them, but they're easy to keep them around 8 foot if you do trim them. Um, the M7 is a little bit shorter. But they, and they don't need quite as much water as the super dwarfing rootstocks. So we go with that instead. Um, and also, the semi dwarf rootstocks, your trees can get into production right away. Usually by the second or third year. So a lot of the varieties of trees we get will even produce a bit the first year, too. So when they plant orchards, Generally what they have is two guys digging a hole, one guy putting the tree in the hole, the two guys covering up the roots with dirt, and that's it. They said they spent about 20 seconds on each tree. Um, uh, generally in the Central Valley where they do a lot of planting, the soil right there this time of year is pretty wet, so they don't even have to worry about the water. If your soil is not really wet, go ahead and water it in good once, make a little basin around the area. Um, now make sure you cover the roots. You can plant them a little deep all the way up to the bud union where this knobby stuff occurs. I planted them deeper than that to see if anything went wrong and really nothing, does, nothing bad happens, but we'd rather leave it. Originally they were grafted about three to four inches above soil level. So if you, this is three to four inches above soil level, you're fine. Now apple trunks are a little subject to sun burning. If they get hit by full on sun in the summer, they might sunburn. So now there's one detail that we'll, I'll mention. So on this rootstock, the roots are like this and they're grafted on one side. So it's kind of like this. This area here sunburns kind of easily. So they sell you to orient your tree so that this is south and that, uh, excuse me, south and this is north. So if the sun's coming in like this, it can hit this area. So that one area right there where it dog legs to one side of the rootstock, 
that's the area that's most sensitive to sunburning. I mean, all this can sunburn too if we have really a bad heat wave and your tree doesn't have enough foliage. Uh, so you can paint it white. Uh, with latex paint or the uh, Ivy Organics product that we have if you want to play it safe. Or you can cover with cardboard or paper, aluminum foil, all that stuff works. So, What we know is that most plants, the oxygen requirement of the roots and water is five to seven parts per million. Uh, pear trees can go down to two parts per million. They're really, you know, that soil can be just swampy and not draining well at all, and pear trees just thrive in it. Apples, about the same. So they're, they're really, you know, if you have a boggy area in your yard, these guys still do okay. So, mm-hmm. Um, should the roots, the longer roots, be pruned at all, or just not worry about Okay, so when you're looking at a bare root, yeah, um, the only thing you watch for, you know, we'd, we'd rather not prune too much, but in, realistically, you know, when we used to get bare root fruit trees 30, 40 years ago, we had a plant that looked more like this. One, it looked like a fishing pole. There weren't, wasn't any branching on it. Plus, the roots looked like one carrot going straight down. We didn't have much of They didn't send us much. Nowadays, we have something that looks like this. This is incredible compared to what we used to get. So... You know, you, you can cut off 90% of this, the tree won't even show any symptoms. Uh, even go down to just a few roots. We've never lost a bare root tree due to broken roots. Uh, sometimes we just have a little bit left and a tree makes it because it'll grow its top just as fast as the roots grow out. So they never get ahead of their root system, it seems. It's because we've had uh, walnut trees come Usually walnut trees, we get roots this long, and sometimes they just break, and we get just a stub left, and we sink the stub in the ground, hoping it'll grow. It always grows. So, uh, um, so you can trim them. You don't have to. Um, what we like to do is anything that's cracked badly, cut it off where it's cracked, or you know, definitely broken, or if it's kind of peeling off one other root, you might want to just cut it clean so that that big uh, cut is not there. And generally, uh, anytime you cut any part of a plant, they seal their wounds immediately. You don't have to worry about sealing them. The only time uh, you might have some trouble is if you have, um, if you're planting an apple tree in an old apple orchard, um, you might want to not cut right before we put in the ground. Sometimes they're subject to a lot of apple diseases if there's old trees around. Uh, and it, it is, you know, there is something called a replant syndrome. So if you pull out an apple tree or anything related to a pear, pear tree and you put an apple tree into that hole, it won't grow. And that's the same with any plant. You pull out a rose plant that's been there 10 years, you put another one in the ground, it won't grow. It just sits there and because it's surrounded by old dying roots of itself or of its relatives and it doesn't like that. If you took out a peach tree and put an apple tree in, it doesn't care. It grows just fine. So that's ro prop rotation. You can though uh, remove the dirt. So I, I met a guy who actually did this in college. He was in charge of replanting an apple tree if they ran over it in the orchard. So every time they broke a tree, he would go in there with his shovel and dig a hole um, I don't know, he might have used a tractor. Three and a half, three foot wide, one and a half foot deep, made another hole at least 20 foot away from any other apple tree and replay, and switched the dirt out. And then they put a new apple tree into that, quote, virgin soil, surrounded by um, old roots of apple trees, but he, again, he got a foot and a half in all directions with nothing there, and the apple trees performed really well. University of California Davis did the study on that. They made the rules for the apple orchards and any orchard. You replant a tree, this is what you do, and you, and you get good results that way. So in your yard, I would say in your own garden, because they said that would give an apple tree 10 foot across really quickly, you don't anything that big. So maybe a two foot wide hole. Clean out a two foot wide by one foot deep. Uh, if you're replanting an apple tree into a, where another apple or pear was, and you should be fine with that. 
Um, do not use compost in the ground. They don't like compost, although apples and pears can tolerate it better than most fruit trees can, but uh, real dirt, sand is fine. Our top pot potting soil is fine. You can grow them in containers. If you want a decent size, you know, I would say for a decent, well, if you wanted to say maybe 20 or 30 apples a year, go at least 15 gallon. If you want more than that, 50, 60 apples, you have to go bigger. That's, this is like a half barrel size or a 20 inch tub. Re, uh, wooden containers are a little bit nicer than black plastic in that if this is exposed to the sun it gets pretty hot here and you will burn the apple roots around the edge of this side. Wood is uh, a lot safer for the roots. They're not super sensitive to temperature like cherries and roses are. Uh, they don't respond too badly, but they do not like to dry out. So that's the main thing. Uh, don't let them dry out. Uh, a little more about care. The main disease problems we have with apples and pears is fire blight. Um, when they're blooming, the bees can come to the flowers. You need the bees to pollinate the flowers, but the bees often carry a disease with them called fire blight. It's a bacterial infection. So if you see an apple or a pear tree in your neighborhood and the stems are, look like they've been torched, turned black, and I don't have any in the nursery that way, but any, almost any pear tree you see in any neighborhood, you'll see some black branches look like they've been torched. Uh, and that's fire blight fungus, bacteria that's, that has damaged that or killed that branch. And the way it transmits back during the winter, this dead branch gets wet and the bacteria inside starts creating an, uh, a honey-colored ooze on it. And the bees look at this thing, they go, okay, what is that? So they test it out to see if it's honey or not. It's not, but the bacteria is now on their body. They visit a flower and it attacks the new flower. So what happens on flowers, normally flower petals are white on apples and pears, you know, blush with the pink blush on them but they're mostly white. When they dry normally, they just turn tan and drop off. If the fire blight is in the flower, those flower petals turn black, and you know it. And then it kind of is like, so if you had a flower petal he, flower here, they got it, then you start getting this black death that starts going down the stems. And it cuts off the circulation, goes back toward the main trunk. If on a small tree, that infection can go all the way through the trunk and kill the tree. On bigger trees, it basically just kills one whole branch. So it is a major problem on both apples and pears. Our best solution for that is this product called Garden Foss, uh, also known as Agrifoss, but it's a foss. It's, it's, in California, it's registered as a fungicide. In many states, it's registered just as a fertilizer because it's mono and dipotassium salts of phosphorus acid. It just raises the phosphorus level of the plant's uh, sap and the phosphorus is part of their immune system <clears throat> and it seems to stop that disease pretty well. Now don't look for us on the shelf. This is an empty bottle because I <clears throat> someone cleaned us out so uh, we've got to get we'll have more of this back in stock but mainly it's you want to spray your trees bef right before they bloom, which is usually around March or April or May. So uh, and you can spray them when they're blooming. And one of the methods that they recommend in here is that right before it leaves out or flowers, you can just mix this with water one to one in a little spritzer bottle and just hit the branches in the trunk of the tree, the lower tr branches and trunk. And that's, it'll s absorb into the uh, sap the plant through the trunk and then uh, prevent the fire blight that way. Now there are other things, copper sprays can work a little bit. We like this one better, the garden foss. In orchards they actually use antibiotics a lot but we don't handle those. You have to have licenses to get antibiotics because it is a bacterial infection. Now if you see fire blight you want to cut it off below the infected part and then clean your pruners um, with bleach 
after each cut if you see the, the blackness on there because you want to clean, you don't want to spread it with your pruners. So that is the major problem. Now you may grow apples and pears for all your life and never see it. Um, in our garden we saw it real bad one year where we had a, um, now certain varieties are more susceptible than others. We had a gal apple tree, which is highly susceptible to fire blight. All the branches were going black on us. It was, it was the young tree, only about three years old, and it was dying. We, we knew it was gonna die, so we just cut off the entire top of the tree down to two foot. And that saved it. Because we, we knew that all the branches were just gonna die back to the ground that way. And it regrew the entire tree within the year, but no fruit that particular year. It fruit the next year. Uh, but that was the most susceptible in my yard, but we had a real bad year. That was 1996, a year after a real wet year. So the wet years seemed to create the fire blight, and then the year after that, everything's real bad uh, everywhere. Um, but again, it's the bees that are carrying it, and if your bees don't have a source of fire blight in your neighborhood, then you may not ever see it. But just you know, kind of watch your neighborhood and see what's going on there. Yeah, it's, uh, it acts that way too. It just acts on the plant's immune system, so it seems to stop that bacterial infection. It stops infections in general. I just sprayed my tree, the tree that's exactly No, yours should be good. Even if, if you do it, you know, they say do it before it blooms, so if you do it sometime now, it should still work. So. Okay, so that one. Um, Generally, both apples and pears get aphids when they're blooming and when the new leaves come out. We don't usually treat that unless there's ants around. You've got to get rid of the ants because the ants prolong the attack. But normally you get aphids for a while, a month or so, and the ladybugs find them and wipe them out, and you're done for the year on the aphids. So, um, that's what is the best way to get rid of ants? We have a product on the shelf called Amdro. It's not organic though. So we have both, we have two organic and controls that work so-so, and then the Amdro works really well. So we, we kind of recommend that one, because it's a bait that, it's cornmeal and vegetable oil, and the ants love it. And it's got a, they put a poison on there that doesn't act immediately. So like the organic ones, the organic ones that are certified for organic farms have a poison that they eat it and it kills them on the spot, but it won't kill the colony. Whereas this one, the poison doesn't work right away. It takes two or three days to work. So they have two or three days to gather up all this poison bait and take it into their colony and then it wipes out the colony and wipes out the whole, all, it seems to like wipe out all the colonies in the neighborhood and they don't see ants for a long time. So we think that one's superior, but it's not considered organic. Of course, you don't have to put it next to your food. The ants will find it. <coughs> Okay, so we've got the ants, the aphids. Um, the other thing that can be real bad in some neighborhoods, so, you know, 30 years ago, we never saw a worm in an apple. No one grew apples here, but now it's quite common to get coddling moths to go into apples. Um, so what happens, it's like about a month before your apples are ripe, the main problem is if you have two apples hanging so they touch like this, then wherever the two apples touch, they have a hole going to each one. And that's because coddling moths, they're, they lay the eggs on the skin of the apple, but there's a lot of critters walking around, lace wings, ladybugs, looking for stuff like that to eat. So if they're not hidden, if the eggs aren't hidden, they get eaten up. So a uh, regular apple just hanging freely hardly ever, rarely ever gets a worm in it. But if your apple's touching another apple or touching the trunk of your tree, then you'll get worms in that apple. So it's, it's important. To, so one of the best things to do, now when apples bloom, apples and pears bloom in the spring, they're in clusters. So you get a cluster of about five to eight even more apples or pears like that. When they're about that big, you take it down to one. 
cut off all the rest and now be careful when you pull them off. Sometimes you pull on one and the whole cluster falls off. But you don't want the clusters close enough together. So if you have another cluster over here, they might be too close. You might have to take off one whole cluster so they don't touch. But you don't want your apples touching anything. Now, we don't want that many apples anyway because when, if you leave the entire cluster, they don't only get about that big. And, they're not, and they're not, they don't taste that good either. So they did a study on Fuji apples to see how many apples the tree can actually make quality apples with. And they said, uh, so you know, the graduate students sat there and counted leaves and counted fruit and see how much they can hold. They said one apple for every 27 leaves is about the right amount for an apple tree. So, but thin out your fruit and most of the coddling moth activity will, will not be happening. Some, there's a few varieties that still get it. John, the, some of the bigger apples, most apples are diploids. They have one set of chromosomes or two sets just like we do. There's a few apples out there, Mutsu, also known as Crispin and John of Gold, which are triploids. And they seem to get worms no matter if they're touching anything or not. So in that case, you might have to treat them. Um, the, the easiest thing to do, well, not the easiest, but the, the once and done thing, since the magazine came with this, they said, you just take a Ziploc bag and zip it over the fruit when it's hanging on the tree, when it's about the size of a golf ball, and nothing will touch it. They said, get your paper punch, punch a little hole at the bottom end to let any water out if it rains. But they said it'll develop fine within the bag. If moths can't find it, any animal can't find it in the bag either. They don't know how to deal with the plastic bag. So that's, that was their method. Now, University of California, 10 years before that, said you get a paper bag, a small paper bag, slice the hole in the bottom with an X-Acto knife, put it over the fruit, roll up the other end, and the apple will develop within the bag. But Sunset Magazine said if it's a clear bag, the fruit turns out a better color and tastes better than they do in paper bags. So that's your options for doing it without any having to spray it. Commercially, they spray apples when they're this big every couple of weeks until they're ripe. And the spray we would rather use is an organic spray like Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew with Spinosad. And if you spray that on the apple every few weeks, you won't get worms either. But if you just make sure they're not touching other apples, that works for most apples. Now the apples that get the worms the easiest are the apples that ripen mid-season. We'll go over, over that timetable because the early apples never get worms and the apples that ripen really late. So one of the things that is unique among apples is that the harvest period is so stretched out. The earliest apples that we pick are in June. The mid-season apples are August, September, October, and then the late-season apples are November, December, January, February. And so we can, you can, if you choose the apple varieties correctly, you can have apples from June to February. That's a long stretch. I mean, peaches, is, it's like May through August is, is it. But apples, you've got June through February the next year. You can, and there are some apples that, that don't go by the seasons too well. You can probably get a fruit at least one or two each month of the year. So there are some of those too. Okay, so we have the coddling moths. We don't get the apple maggots as much, I don't think. I haven't seen them. There's a fly that makes a maggot in the apple too, but I really haven't seen that. I've just seen the coddling moth. Yeah, the spinel said, yeah. Um, now, some apples get mildew on the leaves. Primarily, it's Granny Smith. Interestingly, Granny Smith does not get fire blight at all. I mean, it, it's real tolerant to fire blight. So, you get, you know, so on that side, you get, so you, you know, some apples have susceptibility to certain things. Usually, if you get mildew, you'd hit it with neem oil, and that'll stop it. Neem oil will take care of aphids fairly well. You never seem to get 100% of the aphids if, you know, I would say just let the ladybugs go after them. If you have a real bad case of aphids, we're finding that 
the essential oils work better than the neem oil. So one of the new pesticides out there, and Dr. Earth makes this, and there's a whole bunch of companies now jumping onto the bandwagon too. You take the essential oils that are used uh, for humans, uh, rosemary, sesame, peppermint, thyme, cinnamon, garlic, put them all together, and that wipes out a lot of insects. Uh, they said neem oil being this one oil, some insects may not be killed by that, but when you put that many oils together, different kind of essential oils, and spray them on an insect, it doesn't have much of a chance. And the nice thing about this is that, especially for a farm, most pesticides you have to report to the government whenever you apply anything. Because these are essential oils and they're safe for human consumption, you don't have to tell anybody. So the industry is going that way because they don't, they don't want to tell the government anything. Well, yeah, okay. Rules on oils in general is you want them to evaporate fairly quickly. If they don't evaporate, the leaf or the foliage of that plant will eventually suffocate. They need to have air into the leaves. So what prevents oil from evaporating is moisture. If it's raining or misty, don't apply it. Or if it's too cold, if it's below 60 degrees, don't apply the oils. They don't evaporate too fast. So warm, dry weather is better for oils in general. If the tree is dormant, no not matter. If there's no leaves on it, it doesn't matter. Not with the cleaner oils we have. The, the problem in the old days, so if you go back 50 years, the only time we could spray the dormant oils was in the dead of winter where there's no leaves because the oils were so contaminated with sulfur that the combination of sulfur and oil burns everything, burns all the leaves off. So the only time they could do it was in when it was cold and there's no leaves on the tree. But now that we have highly refined oils, um, they don't burn. I mean... I would say if the sun's not out, it can be 100 degrees and you can still spray it. If the sun's out, I might wait till it's below 95, but we don't really hesitate with oil spraying anymore. It's, it doesn't seem to burn anything. So Now there is one other thing with both apples and pears. Uh, there's a few that are so big, like Johnny Gold apples, Crispin apples, are monster fruit. And they can come down with the same problem that tomatoes have. The big tomatoes, you get that hard spot on the bottom. Blossom end rot, it's a lack of calcium in the tomato. So you spray this right on the tomato once a week and it won't get that. It just is a calcium product. It's because the tomato can't, plant can't get the calcium out of the dirt in big enough quantities to get, make that big fruit finish properly. So the big apples can have that problem too when the trees are young. Um, especially John of Golds, you get in apples it's called bitter pit, you get these hard brown areas in the flesh and that's just a lack of calcium in there so when the trees are young you might have to spray it once a week on the small apples with this calcium spray, just the apples themselves. As the tree gets older the, and the stems get thicker they store more calcium. Wood is a lot, has a lot of calcium in it so as the plant matures you don't have to do it anymore but when they're young you may have to to get to avoid the, the bitter pit inside the fruit. Same thing goes with pears. Some of the bigger pears can get bitter pit too for when the trees are younger. Okay, um, training the trees. So on both apples and pears, the trees that make fruit, uh, the branches that make fruit are the ones that are horizontal. So, a lot of orchards train their trees to look like this. So we do sell these apple espaliers, um, and they just put them on wires and make the branches go sideways. And what happens, when this branch goes horizontally, it starts making all these little short branches all along the stem and the little short branches that only grow an inch or two long start making fruit. Now 
they may not make short branches on their own. I mean, if this tree has been cut all off because this tree was probably making branches like two feet long, three foot long, trying to become trunks again. However, all you have to do is make sure they're cut so they don't get too big. So in, in spring, this might grow six inches, just clip it down to about, you know, keep it around six inches or shorter, two inches, six inches. Don't let it become a trunk. So all summer long, just keep clipping them every couple months, clip them down. And what happens is the leaves that get the most sunlight, the leaves at the very top of that branch will then make a flower bud in the fall. So in the fall is the time when all the apples and pears make flower buds on the leaves that have the most sun. If you have a branch going straight up, the only leaves to get the most sun are the ones at the top. So the tip of each branch can make a flower bud, but any branch you clip short in the summer will then have flower buds right there during the fall. They'll make their flower buds. And then within a few years, they'll stop trying to be a trunk, and they'll just stay right along this branch, and you'll get this nice clusters of apples all in this branch and this branch and that branch. In the old days, so don't, you know, don't buy these older um, fruit pruning brooks. There's one out there, who's it by? Sanford Martin. Because that was my first book I read on pruning fruit trees. It was written in the 1940s. And what they told us to do, because we had apples back in the 80s, that, you know, our apple trees look like this when we got them. They said, let them grow really tall, apples and pears, let them grow really tall, and what eventually happens, so the theory back then was you made sure they grew really tall branches, so they were growing branches, that everything went straight up, and let them get real long, and when they get really long, they just do this. They get so heavy, they just fall open. That takes a long time. Uh, but that's what the, all the orchards used to do. They let their trees grow 20 foot tall and then the branches would just kind of fall open because of the weight. And then they would start making little uh, side branches on the horizontal branches and they would start fruiting. Um, the Tenford Martin book says to encourage it, you prune all your upright branches to an outside bud to make them go outwards more. So I was pruning my apple trees you know, cutting them down to about three foot every winter, pruning them to an outside bud, and then we grow the same branch straight up 10 feet. So after five years of this, I'm going, no, I'm not getting anywhere. I just pulled the tree out and planted something else. Because it was taking forever to get that tree to open up the branching. Um, so now we know you just take the branch and <laughs> force it down. If it wants to go up, you just tie it down. When you tie a branch to horizontal, it just stops growing that way. It just starts, all these little nubs start making new trunks and you just keep clipping them back. And then you've got to product tree a lot sooner. So. so on this pear tree here, we haven't really done any training on it because you can't, it's hard to do it in a pot. So all these, this, all these branches here are trying to become trunks. Now there's no rules about this. In orchards, they don't want more than one trunk. The tree will still produce if it has several upright branches, but you make sure that you have some horizontal branches off of those branches. So if, if you want to work with three trunks, just because they're already there, go, that's fine. You don't have to cut them off. But just make sure all the branches coming off them are trained horizontally and then those will produce. It just makes sense not to have three of them or four or five or six or however many you want, you know, trunks a tree has, but you can take these and then just tie them to a stake on the ground or tie them to a lower branch and then they'll start producing fruit faster. What do you use to tie them so you don't Well, you can use, what I used to do is put stretch tape around here and then loop a rope through the stretch tape and tie it down that way. Now, the, originally they said tie rocks or weights to them, and then they found out, oh, that's too dangerous. You're going to kill yourself when you walk through the orchard on a windy day. So they said, yeah, just tie it to a stake. So all you do is you force them to the shape you want, and they'll produce much faster. Otherwise, when they're all heading up like this, you essentially get one flower bud on each branch at the very tip, where the leaves get the most sunlight. Now, these aren't flower buds here. Um, 
Now some of these, this has made some little short branches come off the side, and this was a flower, but that was a little fruit forming on that one. But generally they get, this is a, a fruiting spur. So this isn't, this probably doesn't have a flower but on it, but that's how they get started. Little fruiting spurs, these enlarge over the years, get real knobby, and then they, those are flower buds that they're making on those after a while. And this is a fruiting spur on this branch here. And those may be flower buds right there. Really good production. So, if it has on a vertical, I mean a, a horizontal one, if it has the big tall one, should I just cut those to about two inches? Is that yeah. what you're saying? Yeah, cut it short. If it's, short. They call them water spouts when they just start on a horizontal branch and go straight up. Yeah. Just cut them short. Now, the one good thing about apples and pears is other than the potential of getting infected with fire blight, they're very tolerant of severe pruning. I mean, the stone fruit hate to be pruned. Uh, peaches and nectarines, you prune a big branch like this, you kill the tree. Essentially, you kill the tree. Or you cause it to die a lot younger because they can't seal that wound. But apples and pears are the best sealing trees known in nature, in the entire nature. So apple orchards, even though they're pruned severely, those things can go 150 years. Whereas a peach orchard, modern peach orchard, 13 years is about max. <laughs> Because they're dying when you're pruning them to make you know make better quality fruit by pruning them, you're killing your tree. So um, you know they used to go 25 years on peach orchards, and they found out production peaks at around eight or nine years, and it starts to go down after that. No use having it after 13. Whereas apple orchards, 100 years, no problem. So. The trunk doesn't stretch ever. Yeah, so the only part of a branch, a branch that can stretch is the growing tip. The maybe a couple inches toward the tip can stretch when it's still real young. It can stretch a bit in response to light, perhaps. But uh, generally, nothing else moves on a tree. So. OK, so this. We have some trees look like this. This is almost perfect to start off with. If you can get a tree that looks like this, the branches are right where you want them. You don't have to do a darn thing. Um, you know, with the, with the weight of the growth, the branches will probably just drop down to perfect horizontal, but you can train them a little bit if you want to. They'll develop fruiting spurs all through this area, and you'll have your crop. Now, they want the branches to be about a foot apart. So on this side, that's a little close. You might want to go with this and this rather than these three. And on this side, you got this one, this one. They're a little close too, but not bad. This side, you got one, two, three going up that side. You might take this one out. And then here you've got big gaps. So what you might do on this tree is cut it right here, which will force the, usually the top three or four buds to make branches and then train one back straight up and the other one's more horizontal. So now orchards, when they buy trees, they don't buy anything that looks like this. This is too expensive for them. So the size of the trees, the, the growers charges different prices. It's not a huge difference, but it is, you know, from this to this, it may be $2 a tree different. Um, but for an orchard, that's real expensive when they're planting thousands and thousands of trees. So in orchards, they, they say don't buy anything bigger than this, but then they have to train them. Uh, now in Canada, I've seen a lot of pictures, they buy trees like this because they don't have time to grow them. <laughs> you know? so, um, so most orchards buy a tree like this, but what they're forced to do then is cut it where they want the tiers, the branches to form. So like this one, it's got one branch already, so you probably cut it maybe here and it would branch out in this area. The top, you know, generally wherever you cut it, the buds closest to the top open up and start growing, not the ones down here. The ones closest to where you cut it start growing first. So if you cut it just a few nodes above this branch, you can save this branch as a side branch. 
and then have another all the, a lot of branches come out there and then train them, most of them to be horizontal and then one to be the main trunk go back up and then when it reaches maybe a foot higher clip the top off of that also or maybe a two foot higher and then clip it back down to one foot and then all the top buds in there will make another tier of branches. Now in Canada they said they can only make one tier a year because their growing season is only four months. Here with almost a year round growing season you can make a tier here, let it grow another two feet, cut it back down, make a tier here, just keep on making the tiers as the tree grows so you can fill in all the gaps. About a foot apart up the trunk. But let it go about two feet before you cut it back so you have some, it takes a while for the buds to develop. You know, if you just cut the tip, you may not get all the buds opening up again. Would you pick a node that is in the direction you want the next one to go? True, that sometimes doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> it's like on rows, you're supposed to cut them right up above the node that the direction you want it to go and sometimes it just doesn't fall through. Now with apples, the nice thing about apple branches are so flexible you can do this to the branch. So they say sometimes they have to do that. They have to take a branch from one side and just direct it the other way. It's fine. It still produces. So, Like especially with these espaliers, when they're training espaliers, sometimes they just don't have a branch on that side. So they'll cut one of these real short, and when it re-sprouts, they'll direct it all the way that way. Now this one, this is interesting. So what this grower does is, a few years ago we had another grower that just took one of these trees and made a spellers out of it, and you can do that. But what this grower does is to make sure they get them in the right spot real quickly. This is all M7 apple tree here, the rootstock tree, and they graft six branches onto it at the spots where they want. So it's grafted that way. Unfortunately then you can't, if anything grows out of this trunk, it's not the same tree, but you can graft more branches to it. Or, you know, this sprout here, you can just direct it straight up and make another tier if you wanted to. Because this, this is, truthfully, this is kind of short. In a pot it's fine, but in the ground this will be just a foot off the ground. And this will just be three foot high. It's a bit short. Most orchards have tiers going up to about six feet or so. But again, you can do it. It'll, it'll sprout branches here off of these branches, and you can just then make another tier uh, higher up. So if that's M7, and all dies back to M7, what does it produce? Nothing that you want to eat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even sure M7's a, a fruiting apple. It might be a crab apple. So. This one will. I mean, it's like a brand new branch that will grow. And it's mm, generally, it's well, year. yeah, usually the second year the branch can f potentially fruit. I mean, the Fuji apples, and this is a Fuji, are real slow to develop flowers. Really slow. They're the slowest apple we've seen. When I grew my first Fuji apple back in the 80s, it took four years to get the first flower buds. Oh. Whereas this is an ant apple. This thing will make 100 apples this year if, if, you, if you put it in the ground. It, it really, any bud on the branch, even if it doesn't, is not developed now, it can develop immediately when it wakes up and make flowers and fruit. And it can fruit several times a year and it can fruit year round. It's, it's a weird apple tree. So. Do you always go that to put on a wall or do you just put that in the middle of an orchard? Yeah, that, that, there's a lot of orchards that are on wires to do it that way. So. so when you have a tree shaped like this, there so a lot of the modern orchards, the apple trees look just like that. And they call this a spindle shape. It's what the, a lot of them are using. Or they do it on a, on a wire truss. Those are the two methods most commonly used. Now, in theory, this is the most efficient shape to have a fruit tree, about five, six foot wide, and seven, eight, ten foot tall, something like that. You get your more fruit per square foot than any other form. So in the old days, the apple trees were shaped more like this. And certainly one tree will make a lot of fruit, 
but you're not getting that much per square foot because if this is south, these fruiting spurs are shading themselves. This, these branches are shading themselves. These branches do fine, yeah. but these branches don't make as much or make as quality fruit. So they went, you know, in theory, supposedly the dome is the perfect shape, but it's hard for it to make domes. This is much easier to create than a dome. So, and for homeowners, this is better anyway because this is smaller. So on a tree like this, five foot wide, some foot, that's probably about 100 fruit. Something that was 15 foot across, 300, 400 fruit, what in the world do you do with that? So you can get, and you can line up, if you have a 20 foot by 20 foot area, you can get, uh, would that be uh, 16 apple trees in that area, 16 different varieties, and have 16 different ripening periods if you wanted to. Of course, you, you know, you can plant anything else you want to. Yeah, it's a little hard to train peaches this way. In Canada, they do because the season's short. In California, what they've gone in peaches, just so you know, is to two trunks. They cut it short and make two. They said one trunk is so vigorous, it's just these things just grow too fast. Uh, two trunks, there's a little less vigor in the growth, and it's easier to maintain it at the proper size, so they use a double trunk instead. But I know for a homeowner, you can sit there and prune them. Let's keep them that shape. In orchards, they don't want to do so much work, so they're going to two or sometimes three or sometimes four uprights. They used to do 16 uprights, but it took half the tree's life to create that, so they don't do that anymore. Okay, so that's, so anyway, it's nice to keep your trees, you know, below 10 feet so you can pick the fruit, or even below 8 foot. And they want to be bigger, but as long as you keep pruning them for, you know, if you prune them for about four or five years, they just stop growing big, especially on the semi-dwarf root stock. Any other questions on training? Yes. You said that a fruit when they're horizontal, is that true for most fruit trees? Well, no, not, not every fruit tree does that. Um, no. Like fig trees, just whatever they make a leaf, they make a fruit. How about stone fruit? Uh, We'll go over that when we go over the stone fruits. But in, in general, the horizontal branches fruit better than the vertical ones, but uh, uh, there's a lot of little details. Oh, didn't mention fertilizer. So apples and pears, you might want to fertilize them for just one or two years. And after that, just put a good organic mulch on the ground because we really don't want the size on these trees. So the, f the fertilizer isn't as important as water is. So when you first plant them, uh, now in orchards, you know, usually they don't even fertilize the first year, but the trees are all by themselves and there's no competition. If you've got a normal yard and you've got shade trees in the area, uh, they're competing with your, your fruit trees for fertilizer, so it's nice to go ahead and fertilize them. Now, in our nursery, we always use osmocode, which is a time-release chemical that's very complete. But in a home garden, especially in the long run, short, you know, you can do this once, no big deal. But in the long run, we like to use organic fertilizers like either Dr. Earth or something with a lot of nitrogen in them to get them to grow f at least the first year. So this first number on this box, 612, that's the nitrogen. This is a really good formula for uh, any fruit tree that I can think of. But they'll both work fine. Um, and then after you know a few years, if you just leave the dead leaves on the ground and let them pile up, they're good with that. Oh, I didn't mention, I just noticed this. This tree has some leaf spotting going on. Fabrea leaf spots, they also call it entomosporum leaf spot. So pears get this. We don't usually treat it in California. You can treat it, but it's more serious up in Oregon or East Coast where it rains all summer. 
So we get this whenever we get rain on the leaves, and we had some rain, what, two months ago? Well, the leaves are still there, so they got some. I mean, some of the El Nino years, the rain's till June, then you, it'd be pretty serious some years. You know, the leaves start falling off because of this, but then they grow back in the summer and the tree's fine. Uh, so we don't normally treat this fungus spot, but um, just because we're dry weather. And there's another thing that we've only seen once. On apples, if you're in Oregon, one of the biggest problems is something called apple scab. Now, if you, know, if you grow roses and you see black spot, it's exactly what it looks like on apple leaves. So we've only saw it one year, 1995, when the El Nino lasted all the way into June, uh, and our apples got some scab. Now, the problem with scab on the leaves is it transfers the fruit, and it makes big black corky areas on the skin of the fruit inedible. So it ruins the crop. But again, we've only seen it one year. So I would say probably not a problem. There are fungicides that take care of it, but uh, we haven't had to ever use them. We've only seen that scab one time. So uh, we're just not as wet. Question on the first one. Okay, mm -hmm. So you got the organic, and I was told once that if you put something like osmocote, it fouls up the whole organic process going on. You can do both. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't know who says that. <laughs> yeah. If your if your soluble phosphorus levels are too high, then that can kill off the fungi that do the organic cycle. So you don't want chemical phosphorus, uh, water soluble phosphorus around. Um, this doesn't have that much in it, but there are some. You know, the main fertilizers to avoid are the ones that are like. I don't know, there might be one on the shelf, 555, real high middle number, and it's chemical, that can mess up your organic processes in the ground. That phosphorus is the same as what's in the uh, trench for the apple trees, the, one, the other products we have, with that phosphorus too? Yeah, but you're spraying this on the foliage, not on the ground. Oh, okay, so yeah. you have to get a trench. Yeah. And in a quantity amount, this is like uh, probably only about 5% of the content of this bottle, and you dilute it down, it's pretty low once it's applied. So. Is there a rule of thumb like how much fertilizer to put based on the size of the tree? No, I talked to the guys at the plant and soil labs in Anaheim, and they said there's no way a homeowner can ever figure out how much fertilizer to put on. We're just estimating. Now, as a rule of thumb, what the organic fertilizers are doing is about one cup per inch of trunk diameter. So if your trunk is about, that's about an inch, about an inch thick, you put about a cup of this on there every few months, every month or two. But they said there's no way. I mean, you know, what orchards do is they send their leaves to the plant and soil lab and they analyze them and tell them how much to put on. There's just no way for you to know if the leaves look decent, you know, green all the way through, you're probably fine. Uh, I mean, you can put as many dead leaves around your plant as you want, you won't hurt it. Or you can, if you overdo organic fertilizers, nothing ever happens wrong. If you overdo chemicals, yeah, you can burn. If you put like five times too much of this on a plant, you might burn it. But organics, you know, they're not going to hurt anything. So if you want to, if you want to overdo it, it's fine. Okay, let me think if I thought of anything else. I think we're good. Okay, we'll go over the varieties. So what I'll do on apples is we'll start with the, the harvest times. So you know which are the early apples. There's two really early apples that we're carrying. So these bloom really early. There's another third one that we've carried before, and I still have one tree here called Einschmier. Einschmier and Anna from Israel. Dorset Golden was a seedling found in the Bahamas. Oh, one note. So apples are being grown all over the world now, but not in the super hot climates. Even, you know, like 5,000 foot up in Ecuador, they're growing apples. 5,000 foot up in the Philippines are growing apples. So the temperature, what apples don't like is consistent 90 degree weather when they're ripening. You know, the, the, the two or three weeks before they ripen, 
If it's 90, 95 degrees, they don't turn out as good as they could otherwise. So, you know, the deserts of Arizona, they don't really grow apples there because it's just too hot. But in the Philippines, they've been growing Rome Beauty since the 1980s. And Rome Beauties, they put on Rome Beauty the chill factor of a thousand hours. Well, the mountains of the Philippines, the coldest ever gets is 57. They don't get any chill there. The apples are evergreen. But what they do, so apples like chill, but they have a backup mechanism that works okay. So what happens is if there's no leaves on the branch and the weather's warm, the tree wants to grow leaves. When it grow leaves, it's got to open the flower buds too. So in the Philippines, what they're doing, what they found out they can do is when the fruit's ripe, they pick it. Two weeks later, they just strip the tree of all the leaves. And two weeks after that, all the flower buds open up and they get a new set of leaves, a new set of flowers, a new set of fruit. And then after that crop's done, after six months, they just do it again. So they can get two crops year, year round, anytime they want, they just pick all the leaves off. And without the leaves, the flower buds that develop, you know, it takes a few months for flower buds to develop after they start growing. So you can't strip them all the time. You gotta wait four, five, six months, and then you can strip them. And then those flower buds that develop then start growing and you get another crop. So the main thing is no leaves and warm weather. Good point. So anyway, so the early apples like Dorset and Anna don't seem to need any winter. They always, so Dorset usually blooms late January, Anna early February, Einschmier is kind of between those two. And these guys are the early apples. This is June and this is July. Um, now I'm not a fan of Dorset in this area because it's too early. It's June, even late May some years. It's a yellow delicious uh, daughter. And when I've grown it locally, it's turned out to be pretty tart because we don't have the heat to sweeten it up good. Now my father-in-law lived in Hemet, wonderful there. It was already 90 degrees in June in Hemet. So, uh, so in the Bahamas, this would work well too. It's always hot there, but here, Inland Orange County, maybe. Coastal, not so good. And uh, uh, July, perfect. It always tastes real good. I do like the Annas a lot. So this is, Annas are kind of a green red apple, but they're really big. They're like, you can get apples that big easily on the tree. Now, Anna and Dorset, we sell both because Dorset and Anna pollinate each other. Now, so apples, we consider them partially self-fertile. They'll make fruit by themselves, but the quality's a little better if they are pollinated. Now, I didn't like Dorset enough, so I pulled it out, just grew the Anna instead. When I had both, the Anna apples were bigger and better shaped. When I pulled out the Dorset, they became sometimes flat-sided. And when you open up the fruit, instead of having the six seeds in there, there was only like one. So with, so with by itself, it wasn't getting a full set of seeds. So commercially, they never plant just one type of apple because they get lopsided apples. Apples aren't as big. So it's nice to have two kinds, but if you don't like one, you know, they still make them. And to me, they were good enough. I didn't, want, I didn't need the dorset around to make that Anna as good as I wanted it to be. So they're a little smaller, not quite as symmetrical, but still made plenty. So I just went with, with the Anna by itself. But these are early apples. Uh, the early apples bloom way before the other apples do. So all the other apples we have bloom later. Now, if you are in Oregon, each apple they grow has a two-week window of blooming. So they have to choose their apples very carefully for pollination purposes. In Southern California, they have all these asterisks that said, Southern California, apples don't know when to bloom. So instead of blooming for a two-week period, short two-week period, all the rest of the apples seem to bloom for two months. They're trying to figure out, okay, is it spring yet? Is it spring yet? <laughs> so between May and July, they're blooming. So they said, you know, the rest of the apples, you can pick any two you want. They'll pollinate each other. There's a few apples that are considered pollen sterile, John and Gold, 
is the only one I think we carry that you're not supposed to use as a pollinator. But all the other apples can pollinate the other apples. So almost any two apples other than these, these two have to be worked together along with Einschmier if you wanted to get that one. All the ap other apples seem to bloom for months and months and months in late spring and they seem to work. So these two by themselves and both of these can make that second crop because they're so early if you pick some leaves off in July after these are done fruiting, uh, you'll get a second crop October, November. When do you prune those? Right now. Right now. Or earlier. But the nice thing about, especially Anna, even if you don't see it, like this looks like a flower, but that doesn't. But even if you cut it to there, it still makes one. It's like you, can, you don't even see any flower buds there and it still blooms. It just is crazy how fast it makes flower buds. So yes. on my Fuji, should I pick off all the leaves that are on there right now? Not yet. As I'm pruning? Not, Not yet. So Fuji is supposed to bloom in April. So by March, pick all the leaves off. If you leave the leaves, if they're still there, it's, they're still making flower buds and still getting energy, so just leave them. Okay. But you can, well, you can prune it for shape and all that, but leave the leaves that are there. And then right around, you know, two weeks before you expect it to bloom, you can just take your fingers and go along the stems and, and all the leaves just pop off. Okay. Um, but yeah, you might as well leave it until it's supposed to bloom. So. It never goes dormant, Well, if it gets colder, it will. I mean, we're at the, you know, this year we're, we haven't really had a frost at all yet. So we haven't gone that cold, but we've had, like back in the 80s, we had cold enough winters that all the apple trees would go to sleep. Uh, five years ago, none of them went to sleep. You know, they all just stayed with. Just too big to stress. So. Yeah. yeah, it's not essential, but it helps them to bloom better. Yes? Both of those, they're about 30 feet apart with other things in between. Too far. Okay. So in the, in the orchards, what they used to do is have a row of, Fuji's and a row of gallows next to them because, you know, the book said 20 feet was the furthest you should put two pollinators apart. But the apple guys said when we're watching the bees and go down the rows, they just went down the row. <laughs> they never saw them cross from one row to the next row. So now they put the apples right adjacent to each other, the different kinds of apples, because the bees are lazy. The closest flower is where they go to. They don't cross the eight foot between the rows <laughs> to get to the other apples so uh, put them adjacent put them real close so Anna is I would say it's fairly close to Honeycrisp so it's it's very light texture it's not it's not a heavy woody apple like Granny Smith it's very light textured uh, it's sweet with a, just a hint of tartness. So I like them, I like them a lot. The disadvantage of the early apples, so they have a storage problem. So none of the early apples store well. The, late, the later the apple ripens, the better it stores, and the better the hang time. So these apples have no hang time. You, you know, when this apple is half red, you pick it. When it's totally red, it's mushy already. Although I'll still eat them, but they're already losing their crispness. The only way to store these apples is to put them in a Ziploc bag and throw them in the fridge, and they'll store for two months. But you have any ox. So when they store apples commercially, what they do is they put them in a storage compartment and throw some carbon dioxide in there, and that stops the ripening. And so the longest storage apple is Fuji. They can store Fujis in a high carbon dioxide atmosphere for a year and a half. Granny Smith a year. Um, but those are the better storage apples. And even in your refrigerator and a Ziploc bag, you can probably, you might be able to do a Fuji for like half a year. You know, just seal it so no auction get in there. So, um, but the Andes will do two months in a sealed bag in the fridge. And one of our employees' mom said, yeah, the best thing to do with Anna's you take a straw and you open up one corner of the bag, you suck out all the air and then you seal it back up and you throw in there no air in there they stay good for even longer. So, so that's the disadvantage, Anna, you've got to pick it before it turns totally red. Dorset, you've got to guess because it's kind of greenish yellow when you pick it. 
because they do mush out fairly fast. Um, now we do have another apple out there called Ghost, but we didn't get Beirut this year. Ghost is a new one. It's very, it's kind of ivory colored. And it's very similar to Anna. It ripens a little later than Anna, so it's also July, maybe late July. This is more early July. Um, it's not that exciting, but it's just a neat to have this in a bowl with red apples near it because it's almost, it looks white next to the red. It's actually cream colored. But it's a sweet apple like Anna. And then Gala's ripen. Um, more or less August. Uh, galas uh, are the most susceptible to fire blight, so you have to be careful with that. And galas don't seem to mind the heat of the summer on them, so even if it's 90 degrees every day, they don't seem they don't seem to be hurt by that. Ghost was developed here, Gallus in New Zealand. And then John and Gold comes in next. So John and Gold's August into September. Now John and Gold's at the store, sometimes they're mushy. They don't store as well as the other apples, but off your tree, they're really good. John and Gold won, was the one taste test back in the 80s. And they're still, you know, especially on the coast. So they're, the quality goes down a little bit inland because of the heat at that time, but near the coast, they're wonderful. One of our customers in uh, Newport, no, um, Costa Mesa. No, he's in Huntington Beach. He says best apples he's ever grown. He grows them about a mile from the ocean. He loves the John Now, John Gold's, they say, want a pollinator. I don't know, we've seen him produce fruit without it, but again, they'll probably be better with the, with the pollinator. So that's John Gold. And Fuji is the next one. Fuji is the most popular apple sold at stores at the moment because it stays firm the, the longest. So it's September, October. At this point, you know, the hang time on these apples is pretty good. You can leave them on the tree for a month or so. They don't get mushy on the tree. And then we have, uh, now Pink Pearl, We've eaten it one year, and I can't remember her exact date on it. Time ripening. It's summertime sometime. Let me just look it up. So on Dave Wilson's website, they've got this ripening chart for all the fruit trees that they sell. So on apples, I think this one's too old, it doesn't have pink pearl on it. Let me look that up real fast. So it's apparently the same time, so pink pearl It's supposed to be on the tart side, but we ate them. They, we liked them. They're not bad. So pink pearl is interesting because it's kind of a pinkish apple on the outside, reddish apple, but the inside flesh is also bright pink. So it's a different pink flesh. There's another apple that has red flesh, but it's really tart. So we, this one's improvement over that. So September, October. And then the late apples come in, uh, Arkansas black. Get the date on that proper. We haven't grown this one yet, but people keep telling us to carry it, so we've been carrying it. Uh, it is October, November. 
And then the Australian apples come in. So you have uh, Granny Smith. Pink Lady. And Sundowner. Granny Smith is grown, and Pink Lady are both grown in Oregon. I thought, and I read that Granny Smith was developed near Sydney. I'm going, has to be a mountain near Sydney because Sydney's in the tropics. So I looked at a picture where Granny Smith was, you know, Mrs. Smith developed, uh, found it, growing by her compost pile. She's on the delta by, at sea level. So Granny Smith is from uh, the same climate as Mazatlan, Mexico. Of course, Dorset's from the Bahamas too, so it's no different. And Pink Lady and Sundown are developed in um, Perth, which is similar to Orange County. So these tend to be our best performing apples. This is Granny Smith, you have to watch out for the mildew now. The interesting thing about Granny Smith is that like in Oregon, they have to pick it green in October because it's going to freeze soon afterwards. Here, you just leave them on the tree. By Christmas, they're yellow. Right now, they would smell. The, they just this. They get this perfume in January. Just you just, I remember my neighbor had a tree halfway down between her houses. I can smell it when I pull up on my driveway. The fragrance off that apple is incredible in in January and February. It just reeks. The fragrance. It doesn't get mushy. It turns yellow and becomes a sweet apple. I don't know if that's what it does in Australia, but here, if you just leave it on a tree and it'll hang till February, it's yellow sweet apple. So it's interesting. My neighbor would pick most of theirs for pies in November. But. Oh, yeah. Uh, it doesn't lose that at all. So, so Granny Smith has, uh, you know, you can say. November to February. Now, Pink Lady and Sundown are November through December into January, really. So, Granny Smith is, you know, when you if you pick them green, they're real firm, really firm, almost like eating wood sometimes, and they're pretty tart. Pink Lady is somewhat sweeter and less firm. And then Sundowner is even a little bit sweeter and less firm than Pink Lady. So in Australia, they're known by different names. This is Cripps Pink. And this is Cripps Red. I wish they wouldn't change names when they bring them here. But Cripps Red is the best apple I've ever grown. Uh, Crips Pink was pretty darn good too when I first grew that one. I thought, boy, this is like eating uh, candied apple because you know it's got that really sweet and really tart going thing going on. But Crips Red is a little bit softer and a little bit sweeter than Crips Pink because Crips Pink is running a little close to me. Sometimes I take a big bite and you bite your tongue because it suddenly gives. Whereas Crips Red is a little more tender, a little more toward uh, Honey Crisp or Fuji than than Granny Smith. So uh, this is the best one I've grown. So we, we saw a lot of sundowners. Because uh, that is, and the trees come into us pretty nice too. So this is a sundowner versus typical Fuji looks like this. Typical sundowner looks like that. They, they, they're nice looking trees. And they often produce, there's a flower bud on the end of that branch so they can make fruit the first year. Usually. Okay. We, we have one with four different apples and one with five different apples. Right. So I was wondering what would be the ripening time on those. Well, you just have to look at the varieties and see what the ripening date is. We tried those for a few years and gave up because um, the least likely apple to take, you know, when you put five, they usually graph five and sometimes four take, sometimes three take, sometimes two take. Usually the one that fails is the Fuji because it's the slowest. So we get these, we order the four and one apple with the Fuji on it, and we get a three and one apple with no Fuji. We're going, I can't sell this one. People want the Fuji on there. 
And, we'd, and it happened two years in a row, we said, no, forget this. Because the one we wanted the most was the one that we're always missing, and the ones we didn't want were the ones that we had. So we kind of gave up on that. Uh, just just get, buy the apples you want, put them real close together, or, you know, keep them small. Because the other way you can grow apple trees or any fruit tree, uh, um, instead of letting them grow five feet, you can just put five apple trees together 18 inches apart and grow them as one apple tree that way. And we've done that or in our yard, just put five of them in a group real tight and their branches pretty much go like that and you have five different apple trees. So you can choose the ones you want that and each, and when they're on their own rootstock, they're much, you know, when you graft them all, what they have to do is they either have to graft them onto a golden delicious or to a dorset golden because the golden apples take the grafts better. But that makes the golden delicious or the dorset the strongest one in the group because it's the main trunk. Whereas if you have five different apple trees and five different trunks, they're all equally strong and they're more likely to succeed that way. Yes. You can grow it, you just don't. The problem with, okay, so the nice thing about these apples, even though they bloom late, later than they would in February uh, in Oregon, they ripen late too, so they have plenty of time, you know, they have five, six months to get ripe. They actually, I think they ripen later here than they do in Oregon because we don't have the winter. The problem with Honeycrisp is it ripens in August. And it's from Minnesota. It's got a real high chill. It doesn't bloom till July. So it makes fruit here, but they got one month to develop. So the biggest uh, uh, Honeycrisp, because we grew it for like 10 years, the biggest fruit we ever got on Honeycrisp was like that big. It tasted fine. It was Honeycrisp. But there's no time to develop because this, there's such an early apple with a l late blooming period. They're the last to bloom, earliest to ripen. A real early ripening, didn't have time to develop. Uh, one year, the coldest year we ever had was 2008 with it. It was really cold that year, and they bloomed in June. So they actually got that big, size of apricots. But we just, you know, so Dave Wilson, you asked Dave Wilson, they said, oh, they produce fine. Well, they do produce fine, but they just don't get any size. Now, we've heard that they've gotten good, good sized fruit in Riverside. So you just get them to a colder winter area, they've got a chance. Now the reason why they do much better in Oregon and Minnesota get bigger, because, and they say Granny Smith grows a lot faster in Oregon too, is because they're closer to the Arctic Circle. The days are a lot longer in Minnesota. I mean, you, you know, their days are what, 18 hours? And our days are only like 14 hours, so their apples grow much quicker in, in the northern areas. So, yeah, Honeycrisp. Now, they're coming out with Honeycrisp offspring. So we're watching those. So a lot of the apples, Opal, Jazz, um, the, the offspring of Honeycrisp are Cosmic um, Crisp. And they said um, there were some at uh, Trader Joe's this year. I didn't see them. Uh, and there's another one from New York called Sweetheart. Cosmic Crisp is from Washington. Um, they might have lower chills. We hope they're more normal. But a lot of these apples, what happens is when they develop a new apple for commercial use, they won't let the homeowners have it for 10 years. So 10 years from now, you know, maybe five years from now, we'll see Opal and Jazz and Envy and all those neat apples there. And then uh, maybe 10 years from now, we'll see Cosmic Crisp. They're selling the Cosmic Crisp at Ralph's. Okay. I bought some. So that's supposed to be a daughter of Honeycrisp. And I don't, I, how did you like that one? I liked it. I really did. It yeah. yeah, they said it was good. And then Sweet Tart from New York is supposed to be another daughter. So we'll see what happens. Because all the apples they've developed in New York have done well here. Uh, I think uh, Johnny Gold's from New York. And uh, now a lot of the old apples, you know, a lot of them like Pippin, you know, they claim, the connoisseurs claim that Pippin is the best apple they've ever, as far as apple connoisseurs goes. I've eaten it, it's okay. Um, they said the problem with a lot of the 
older varieties is they don't, they're more disease prone and Pippin gets a lot of fire blight and more bug prone and more, you know, and not a great producer. So there's a lot of old apples. I've grown Hudson's Golden Gem from Canada and uh, quite a few apples and they've done well, but not many. They don't get much and they get a lot of disease. So, so these are the, the better ones to grow. I think I covered them all. Oh, there's another one called Wine Sap, and I've never eaten that one either. We, someone wanted that one. That one ripens late also. No, that's uh, October. So we have that out there. But I don't know much about Wine Sap. Okay. I can still get them. I mean, you know, they the first apples were promoted. One was called Beverly Hills, which ripens around July, and you couldn't tell when it was ripe because it was a green apple. And then by the time we picked them in August, they're all mushy already. Uh, and then Gordon, Bob Gordon, and Whittier found an apple growing in his yard. He decided, oh, this must be a good apple for the area. It ripens September, October, I believe. Really big, real tart. Um, I don't know, they're okay. They're not, you know, they're not in the top 20 or 30 of the apples, but they're okay. He thought he had something good, but now it turns out you grow anything. So, Okay, so the pears, we don't have many pears we can grow here, so the pears also will fruit even without chill, but they don't get any size either, so because most of the, like, my dad grew Bartlett's for a long time. The biggest he got were this big. They made a lot of fruit, all this size. Because <laughs> Bartlett's would bloom late here and ripen early, too. So uh, they would ripen in August, so they don't have enough time to ripen. Uh, the pears, some pears have done well. So what happens, there's um, the pears from Europe, and there's pears from Asia, uh, China, Korea, Japan. When they cross the two over, so both the Asian pears and the European pears, very few of them would ever grow here. They needed 400 hours or more chill, which we don't get. When they crossed the two, they got some hybrids that would produce here. So they were called, the first ones out were in the 80s. One was called Orient pear. We grew it. Had no flavor. Didn't, didn't appeal to anybody. So they recrossed the crosses back with the originals. And so they got some originals that did well and tasted better. So this is one of them called Hood. So the, this is a European style hybrid. We don't grow Hood anymore, but I'll mention it because we still have some trees around. Then we also have one called Kief, Kiefer. So these are European style pears that are hybrids. Uh, this one is the one we're carrying out because it's a little better, it's shaped about like this. Hood is shaped a little more like that. Um, they both produce quite well in this area. Kiefer might need 200 hours of chill, Hood might need 100 hours. I mean, when we had those no winter winters, you know, 2014, 2015, the hood at my yard just went berserk. I mean, before that it had been a light producer, but I love the warm winters because it's from southern Florida where they have no winter anyway. I was getting like 300, 400 pieces of fruit off my hood. But it's, you know, it's not as good as kefir. So we're, we're switching over to kefir pear, which needs a little more winter. But I think kefir is better. Didn't have enough tartness. It's just my, real too mild. It's okay. I mean, it was okay. I ate them, but uh, you know, like some apples, you'd eat the whole. You know, I, I, Honeycrisp, I'll eat down to the core, whereas these eat half and of this fine. <laughs> Wasn't as interesting a in, uh, piece of fruit. So now we're carrying the Asian pears again. We think the weather's going to go colder on us. Um, contrary to what the global warming people say, 
Uh, there are other scientists who say we're now going into a cold spell of the last 20, 30 years. Um, certainly this year, this last year was one of the cooler summers we've ever seen. We had like one month of heat and that was it. The rest of the year was pretty cool. So uh, we'll see what happens in the next few years, but uh, the Asian pears I love. I mean, if you, ever, if you haven't eaten Asian pear before, um, they have larger cells, uh, like Honeycrisp has big cells, so it's like you bite into it and they, they just crush real easily because the cells are big and they're real juicy inside. So Asian pears have that, it's almost like eating crushed ice. It's just real juicy, and, um, but Hosui and 20th Century are the two we're carrying. Now back in the late 80s, we had some real cold winters. Early 80s were hot, late 80s were really, I mean really cold. 30 degrees, 35 degrees every night, December and January, which we haven't seen since then. So I was growing about a dozen Asian pears back then. Hosui wasn't around then. 20th century was our best producer. Uh, the chill on it's around 300 to 350 hours. The book says 300 to 400. Uh, I think it's below 350, and Hosui says 300 to 400. We hope Hosui is fairly low. Uh, now, people who live near riverbeds can grow, have grown these the last few years with good success. So anytime you're in a low area of Orange County, the cold air kind of collects in the winter and you get more chill. If you live on a south-facing hill, forget it. You won't get the chill there. The, the higher elevations, not, not a mountainside, but a hillside, uh, don't collect enough coal there, you won't get that going, but 20th century and Hosui have done well in low spots, and Hosui is the top rated Asian pear. It's a big brown pear. If you bought, you can buy it, you, can, you could have bought them in the supermarkets uh, earlier this fall. They ripen late summer, really. 20th century is a flatter yellow one. But they're both very, very crispy, mildly sweet. Hosui is a little more interesting. It's got a little tartness near the skin and the core, whereas 20th Century is just kind of bland sweet. But they both have that really neat texture that everybody likes. Um, we're not sure if they're totally self-fertile. 20th Century is. I don't know about Hosui. I'd plant them both. And if you want, if you're, if you want to make sure you have more chill. If you have a house that has north and south sides, plant it about 10 feet off the north wall so it gets sun when they're ripening and shade in the winter, that helps them get more chill. Or paint the stems white or do both. And then you get more chill on the, uh, on the plant and see if you can get them, those producing. So one of the... Um, Astronomers uh, from England says that uh, she's, she's betting that by 2022 we'll have crop failures throughout Canada and northern North America. They said it's, they, they expect it to be pretty cool by then because these, they said the same things that caused global warming between 1930 and, and 1995 is now going to cause global cooling which is this the solar cycle, solar spot cycles. They said, um, her explanation, I don't know if you don't want to hear this, but her explanation was there the magnetic storms, the solar spots on the sun, which make more heat, it's not much, it's like 2% hotter, 1 to 2% hotter when there's a lot of sunspots on there, controlled by three systems within the sun. Each one's out of sync, so normally you don't get too much differences, but they said, for the, you know, they've been counting solar spots since 1500 when they invented telescopes. So they've recorded them all. And they said between 1930 and 1980 or 95, the most solar spots ever, most, most sunspots ever recorded. So the sun was hotter because all these cycles were in sync and they were all on for the first time in recorded history. And now because they're on sync on, now they're all on sync off. So there are no solar sunspots right now, and there won't be much for the next 30 years. And because the sun's just a few degrees, you know, a few percentage points less 
uh, energetic. They said they expect the Earth to cool off for the next 30 years. We'll see. We'll know in a few years if it's really happening or not. So, so we'll see. We might be able to grow anything we want. We might be able to grow Honeycrisp here in five more years. So, okay. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the sun's coming, so let's say this is a house here, this is the south side, north side, and the sun's coming like this in the winter time. This area is shaded on the north side. Now if you have a north wall, that wall gets hit on this wall on the north side of your house gets hit by the sun, but the north wall of the house is in total shade. Oh, you mean the other side? Yeah. I see. I was hanging up against it. Yeah, and then when they're ripening in the summer, you want the sun to hit them, so the sun's higher in the summer. Oh, you know, I forgot one more pair. We have Southern King. This one we think may become a winner. Uh, Southern King is supposed to be a hybrid of Hosui and Tennessee. Uh, so a European pair and a Japanese pair, another hybrid. And Southern King, uh, at least seems to bloom and produce fruit at a normal time. I know we keep selling them. I have, to, I have to hold one back so we can see the fruit ripen. And we've just ordered another one called Tenosui, which might be identical. We're not sure yet. We just ordered it because we saw it. Tenosui, which is the cross between Tennessee and Hosui. <laughs> Southern King may be the same cross. It may be the same tree. We're, we just ordered it. We saw it on the list. And they claim that Tenosui, the chill, may be as low as 100 hours. So we're going to check that out, see what quality fruit that makes, because someone crossed the best of the Asian pears. We'll see if, if that makes a really good pear tree, too. Is it going to be an Asian pear or a regular pear? Don't know. <laughs> well, let's see if the book says. <laughs> You're welcome. Tenosui is listed with the Europeans. Bell-shaped fruit, July, early August, very productive. Fruit remains crisp, so more like an Asian. Slow to oxidize, shows resistance to fire blights. 150 to 450 hours, they're not sure what it is yet, self-fertile. Southern King, it says less than 400 hours to chill, and that's the two years we've had the tree, they seem to, they seem to fruit. High quality pear, unknown parentage, uh, created in Texas. Okay.